So please join me in welcoming Frederick. Grazie, grazie. Buongiorno. Uh, eccellente. So, okay. Benvenuti, buongiorno. Welcome and good morning. So, Botticelli, the curator's view. You all have a handout. Um, and uh, I'm just going to go over a few of these right now, uh, but put something more interesting to look at on the screen. Uh, if you're taking notes or not, just these are terms mostly in Italian. At the top, I have... Uh, we've got bottega, which means a workshop, or also a shop, uh, but a workshop where things are made. It's still a term used, uh, but it's really the, the, the idea of an artist's studio, not a solo artist, but populated by uh, a number of people at various stages in their career who are both learning and help the bottega produce its product. Uh, a cartoon um, is a same scale or full scale uh, drawing for a painting or a fresco. It comes from the Italian word cartone, meaning big piece of paper. A cassone, which we ha it means a large chest, like a wedding chest, which we have an example of the painted front of one in, a, um, in the exhibition. Contraposto is practically an English word now. It means weight shift. It's when you are, have a body, a human body, balanced on one leg, with mo I'm sorry, with most of the weight on one leg and the other knee bent. Also, contrapposto can mean kind of opposites in pairing, but the case we're talking about is the graceful way of having your one leg uh, bearing most of the weight uh, of a figure and the other leg uh, knee bent, giving a nice elegant curve to the body. Um, going down a little bit, uh, fresco is the Italian word for fresh or cool, meaning painting in fresh plaster, wet plaster. The two kinds, aricho is the thick, uh, coarser plaster that goes on the wall first, and then the intonico is the finer one that you actually paint using your minerals, your ground up pigments. They go uh, uh, in the intonico layer, and when that dries, it makes a chemical bond with the, with the wall and is very, very long lasting. We have a spectacular exhibition, example in the exhibition by Botticelli of, um, of the fresco St. Augustine. Garzoni means an apprentice, a, a young boy in the shop. Uh, it was, uh, that was how you started out. You know, you were cleaning brushes and making coffee and carrying things and doing errands. And eventually you got to paint, uh, you got to draw and then you got to paint. And then uh, if you were bold enough and good enough, you'd go out on a solo career. But I'll get to that in a moment. A pentimento is a visible correction in a work of art, generally in a painting where you can see something was painted earlier and then moved. It's typically a contour, like a hand was out further, then comes back, where the eyes were adjusted up or down. But sometimes they're changes of subject matter, you know. Cats painted in, cats painted out, you know. And th these, are, th these are decisions generally made by the artist, and we see them as precious testimony to the creative process, what is going through someone's mind. But they're also important um, because they generally indicate originality. If someone is copying something, they tend to make absolutely no changes. It's kind of rote. Whereas if there's a number of changes of contour, the foot was moved up or down, or things got switched around, or the headdress on the Virgin Mary's head suddenly was more complicated than got simplified, those tend to be things done by the master himself rather than a later artist who's trying to just imitate or replicate. Um, uh, Quattrocento means 1400 or 1400s in terms of a date. That's what we're talking about. Uh, Botticelli, as you see, born around 1444-5, dies though in 1510. So he, but he is the, uh, it's fair to say, the major Florentine painter of the Quattrocento, of the 1400s. Uh, sacred Conversazione, sacred conversation. It's a grouping of saints uh, from different time periods. It's not a picture of any actual assemblage. You could have saints from the biblical times, medieval, all together, and there's several in the exhibition. Tempura, of course, not to be confused with tempura, which is uh, <laughs> Japanese fried food. Um, uh, tempura is using egg, uh, egg yolks, which is a, is a binder, which dries very hard and very quickly. Um, if you've ever left you know, sunny side up egg, the remnants on a plate, it dries very hard and fast, and you mix this with pigments, and you get a kind of enameled uh, surface. Does not dry slowly like oil, so you don't get the possibilities of expression and layering wet on wet the same way you can with oil. Um, uh, tondo, it means round, so it's a round painting, and we have a great example in the show. So, Botticelli, look at those eyes. Look at that face. He is so confident. This is a man at the top of his game. These are eyes that seem to capture everything around him. Don't you want to know more about that person? 
And what about the mind behind those eyes? So that's our subject today. Um, the, this painting was painted for a Medici supporter, a man named Gaspare Della Lama, and it was for a chapel in Santa Maria Novella, uh, which is you know, one, of the, the, the key, one of the key Dominican churches in Florence. The painting's now at the Uffizi, um, um, and it's a picture that is uh, you know, ne never uh, rarely allowed to travel, was not allowed to come to Boston, but there's Botticelli right there. And we can see Botticelli uh, with some of his most important employers and their family, namely the de' Medici family, who were the de facto rulers of Florence, the richest bankers, best connected people in Florence. Um, and we have uh, Cosimo de' Medici, the, sort of the, the, the head of the family there, right at the foot of the uh, Virgin Mary and Christ, very privileged position. Um, now Cosimo had died a decade earlier, so this is a posthumous por uh, portrait. Giuliano is the guy in, um, in red, the second from the left, and then Lorenzo here with his distinctive nose, Lorenzo de Medici, Lorenzo il Magnifico, the Magnificent. Uh, there are other family members as well, but just think about the confidence of the Medici family that, um, or in Botticelli as well, that he's put himself with his support, with his most important patrons, and then implying that he is present at the day of the Epiphany when the three kings come <laughs> to the Christ child. So. Uh, there was, uh, but from what I'll be explaining in a minute, you'll see that this confidence was, was not, uh, not misplaced. Uh, indeed, in 75, he was only going from strength to strength, getting more and more, uh, uh, gr a grander achievement, uh, more innovations, uh, and a, a, uh, achieving greater and greater acclaim. Um, now, Botticelli, this exhibition, does pull in the visitors, and if you've seen it on a particularly a Saturday mid-morning or Sunday mid-morning or Wednesday evening, the exhibition is totally packed. Um, I, and I've got this shake taken at the end of the day, though, when it's not crowded, just to show you, you can look at our beautiful red wall. I'm very happy about that. Um, this, it's a majestic red, um, and the gold lettering uh, really picks up beautifully all the gold in the many picture frames. Um, and, uh, but Botticelli, though, uh, is a famous name, and that's why we led with that. Uh, you know, very large print, that's the poster. There's a giant banner on the Fenway entrance that just says Botticelli, no subtitle needed. He is a, he is a big name, and, uh, and that, you know, the top, uh, most recognizable Italian artist of, of any uh, period. But he is more than an, in a very recognizable name. He, is an, he represents an instantly recognizable style, okay? And what is his style? Let's think about his signature style. And we have a fantastic uh, example within the exhibition. This is a superb painting, just about my favorite um, in the exhibition, the Madonna, the book. It's the first thing you see. Uh, also, I wanted a, something provocative of having a very large wall with a very small painting, uh, so you would know it's important, uh, um, and you, you'd, you'd think that this, by definition, would be worth a closer look. And one, for Botticelli's signature style, though, uh, we're talking particularly about strong contours, very clearly defined outlines, right? Um, nothing fuzzy. The subtlety is in the detail, not in, uh, in a kind of uh, broken edge, but rather a very strong, crisp edge. He, uh, Botticelli's style includes patches of uh, flat patterns of color, right? You can see that, uh, you know, although there's a certain amount of detail in these heavy folds of the drapery here. Overall, uh, this is, you know, big, big triangle of blue there, big patch of, 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 of vermilion red. Um, uh, so, so it's big shapes that often seem to sit on the surface of the painting. Uh, Botticelli is also famous for his transparent flowing drapery, um, and although her mantle is super thick, there's a beautiful kind of veil or head covering that comes down, which is extremely gossamer and quite an, uh, quite an achievement right there. Um, there's also quality of movement, and even in a picture where the figures are ostensibly sitting, just look at the movement of the Christ child's body. It would have been so much easier to paint him just sitting still, but no. Uh, Botticelli kind of showing off, has this amazing twist in his body as he looks up, and notice the wonderful way it's also grounded, that his little hand on top of the Virgin Mary's hand, echoing his mother's uh, pose there, his little hand there. Uh, but he turns up and looks at her uh, as if acknowledgement. They're both understanding that he will be sacrificed, so it's a moment of recognition. But this quality of movement is so important, as well as the porcelain complexions. They, all Botticelli's figures have amazing skin. Um, and to speaking of, um, uh, but this is Botticelli, the famous Birth of Venus. This is the best known, it's Botticelli's best known painting, just about the best known painting in Florence as well. Um, uh, and 
this sort of painting is, uh, is central in the Western concept of the beautiful body. Uh, it's an androgynous beauty. I mean, a lot of his sort of teenage men and women look kind of similar, and that's, uh, there's a sense in, uh, in later Quattrocento Florentine art of, a, of an uh, prizing and androgynous beauty. Um, but what is key in this, this famous painting of the goddess of beauty and love coming out of a scallop shell, rising from the sea, about to be clothed uh, there with... Um, but it's not just the high cheekbones and uh, the ample blonde or chestnut hair, the willowy body. A key thing about Botticelli's beauty, and this is, cannot be emphasized enough, uh, is that his figures flow through space with great agility. And this is the, this, the crucial quality is of gracefulness. And his statues, you see here particularly, but we'll see it in the exhibition as well, um, are graceful like an ancient marble statue, and think of an ancient Roman statue uh, coming to life. And again, we have so often weight more on one leg than the other, the second foot seems to be trailing, a uh, gentle curve in the body, the strong contours, big patches of uh, flat color. Um, and we're going to uh, kind of come back to this because we have uh, better than a surrogate, probably a, probably a twin sister in the exhibition itself, and we'll be talking about that in a moment. But I want to explore how something so universal in appeal, right, so influential centuries later, and Botticelli very much still influence, in, influences all kinds of artists, not to mention uh, fashion and uh, all sorts of consumer products, the kind of byword for effortless elegance. Um, but I want to think about um, uh, how this something that is such a huge brand was the result of an individual's personal creativity and vision of the world. So how an individual's way of depicting the world, uh, not only more or less took over Florentine art in his time, uh, but then also has gone on to be uh, very influential, but that came uh, you know, as one person starting this. So um, returning to the Bedan, the book, one of the goals of this lecture is to cover most of the works in the show, or many of them, give you more context. We're going to use them as well to consider what it meant to when the dominant brand of Florentine art in the later 15th century, the later Quattrocento, that is Botticelli's brand. Um, how can you talk about an individual brand when it's produced by a whole group of assistants working in your bottega, in your workshop? So it seems like a paradox, but no, that was part and parcel of how art was made in Renaissance Italy. And also, since we're all friends here, we can be trusted, I promise to end with a few behind-the-scenes glimpses of how we put together an exhibition of this scope, which is the largest Botticelli exhibition ever held in North America. Yay. <laughs> Thank you. So, so where does this art come from? Where does he come from, Botticelli? His real na full name, uh, is, we call him Sandro Botticelli, but Sandro is short for Alessandro Alexander. Alessandro di Mariano Filippi. He was a leather tanner. And the nickname Botticelli, which means little barrel or wine barrel, uh, may have come from his own chubby brother, who was kind of a hefty guy. And because of that, uh, by some theory, Botticelli was the, the nickname stuck to everybody uh, in the family. Um, and uh, Botticelli, Sandro, the artist, he comes into contact with the art of drawing, which is disegno. And this is a word I should have put on the handout, but I'll spell it if you're taking notes. D-I-S-E-G-N-O, disegno. Um, we're getting back to that, but the art of disegno, to how to draw, is absolutely fundamental in artistic training, uh, then and now. But nowhere so more than Florence, right? The art of drawing has always been art of disegno, buon disegno, the, the, the well-executed drawing, which means the well-considered form. Uh, that's absolutely essential in Florentine art. Um, so he trains, um, Botticelli trains with, a, trains with a painter, Fra Filippo Lippi, and we have great examples by Lippi in the exhibition. I'll mention him in a second. Um, but Lippi himself is deeply influenced by a very powerful artist who dies very young, about age 28, Masaccio. So, this is one of Masaccio's most famous um, compositions. He has a very short career, as I said, dies very young. Masaccio, his real name was, would have been Tommaso Thomas, but Masaccio, the Accio, the A-C-C-I-O uh, suffix means big and bad. So he was a big tough guy, big bad Tom. Um, and what's key about this, these were frescoes done in the Brancacci Chapel, which is in the Church of Santa Maria del Carmine, a Carmelite uh, monastery or convent uh, in the Old Trarno, the, that's the south bank of the, of the Arno River in the southern, south bank of Florence. And hard to believe, but 
at the same time, so many paintings in Florence are very dainty Gothic figures, still some gold backgrounds. Uh, everyone is very willowy in shape, and the point of departure seems to be Northern European elegance. But what Masashu does is, is he says, uh uh, I'm going back for all sorts of reasons to the beefy, sturdy types that come from ancient Roman art. And these figures have these very dramatic faces here that, that are very serious. I like the word gravity when talking about this, both in sense of seriousness and also the sense of physical weight. You can see the bulk of their draperies, these substantial draperies that swirl around the bodies. Um, they inhabit space very convincingly. Depth is something to be not uh, ignored and use a gold background that's flat and precious, but rather see these figures sitting in space uh, with a sense of perspective that as things further away from us get smaller, they diminish in scale. And uh, But keep in mind these big figures here at the ends that kind of look like um, uh, bookends, right? They kind of frame the composition. Uh, and you'll see in this precocious, very early work, this is just the beginning of Lippi's career. This is an important thing. This is in the exhibition. I'll make clear when something uh, is in the show. The painting in the show is much more beautiful than you'll see on the screen. It has a jewel-like quality, but these big guys here with their big heads, uh, strong, broad shoulders, sense of solemnity, all of this uh, uh, is seen beautifully uh, in this painting. And the point is that Lippi would have been a novice uh, friar in the Carmelite Friar, while um, Masaccio is painting in the same church. He's doing the, those chapel frescoes, the Brancacci Chapel. Big, substantial figures. And this painting, number two or three, maybe, that, is, uh, that Lippi does, uh, right at the beginning of his, of his career, these big figures seem to, seem to come um, from that. And one thing we'll see in the exhibition, uh, particularly, and I love it in this comparison, right at the start, as soon as you come in the exhibition, it's on the right, little niche in alcove called Inspiration. Inspiration in the sense of these are all little scale works for private homes designed to inspire the owner to pray more fervently, et cetera, but also inspiration because they were all paintings by Lippi, Fra Filippo Lippi, who uh, was Botticelli's teacher. So all this section of the show shows how Botticelli received his own inspiration from his teacher. Um, but look in the exhibition, uh, the tenderness and the sort of uh, the way the, the little Christ child is worried and has an idea or maybe understands completely clearly what will happen to him. Uh, the sense of majesty of his mother who is both humble and radiant at the same time. The wonderful way that her body is set into this niche with a gorgeous scallop shell motif at the top. Uh, the babies, the little the puti, the little sort of cherubs are super chubby and, and kind of adorable in their, in their sort of pudgy way, um, and then the substantial drapery. All those things are, uh, there's a sort of, it's like sort of masaccio solemnity with a bit of sweetness that is really Lippi's own. And what you see here in this really early Lippi, we can also show you an exhibition at the end of his career. This is 35 or so years later. And this painting by Lippi, really magnificent. It's now big, it's a large panel um, with an interesting surprise. Um, on the back, uh, which I urge you to go around, I have a, I put a label on the wall behind the painting where there's no painting next to it, hoping that curious people like you will say, hmm, there's no painting there, and then you'll go around and you'll see the back. Um, and this, this, uh, uh, it seems to work, um, but, but, but the, 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 this lippy has got so many of the same ingredients, right? The tenderness between the Madonna and child. Look at the way that with her left hand, she cradles his head. She understands that his sacrifice, he is worried, understands it too. There's a lot of great symbolism here. Look at the way they're hemmed in by this amazing marble enclosure, clearly a reference to the sarcophagus in which he will be buried after the crucifixion. Or the emphasis on clothing, this kind of beautiful transparent muslin. He's wearing a sort of little nightshirt there, and then he's grabbing and kind of balling up the edge of her veil there. So the emphasis on textures of cloth, presumably a reference to the shroud in which he will be wrapped uh, for his burial. A lot of things uh, going on in there. So, so this is just a, uh, but, but the real, the tenderness is so important in this, uh, just the, the, the sort of shared bond between mother and child, understanding the implications, as gr huge implications of his uh, sacrifice. Um, so when we think about um, uh, Lippi, is a, you know, I mean, this painting is very important because uh, not only is it an absolute masterpiece, it comes from Palazzo Medici in Florence, it, uh, though we don't know where it was made originally. It's unframed because it originally would have been set in a tabernacle that is a marble, uh, you know, a stone-carved frame on an inside, of, inside wall of a, of a Florentine palazzo. Uh, 
Um, but it's a great thing because it, it shows Lippi at his absolute best and is, was made um, probably just after Botticelli had left Lippi's studio. That is, Botticelli decided around 1467 to go out on his own as an independent artist. And, um, and so this shows uh, you know, Lippi just after that moment, uh, not long before um, his own depth, death. Now, in this, show, in this show, we've got examples of um, uh, three smaller paintings which we're using to talk about artistic lineage, the three generations. This is Filippo Lippi, and I should have written on the, on the slide, and workshop, or really even workshop of Filippo Lippi, because it's, it's a somewhat weaker painting, doesn't seem to be totally in control. For example, the, the ceiling uh, recesses, the perspective there, and the floor don't really seem to match, though clearly they, have to, they should line up somewhere on where that column is if it's vertical. But the point about that is that this is the kind of painting produced in the Bottega, in the workshop of Lippi, that the young Botticelli and other assistants of Lippi would have learned to make as you know, teenagers, right, as or early, you know, early teens. That's the thing they would start doing. Um, and uh, you know, the, the artistic process would include lots of drawing, preparation of materials, that is preparing panels, putting gesso, which is this kind of plaster-like coating on, on paintings, um, doing copies, uh, doing subsidiary parts of a painting, right? The master would be called in for the faces or the hands or the fancy drapery, but things like trees in the background or architectural features, and particularly when there's something really simple, you know, like a, just a simple crown molding or a step, that's the kind of thing you would assign to someone else. Because the point was delegation. If you're going to get your brand out there and be as productive as possible, you need to focus on securing clients and coming up with compositions or the complicated details, the twisted twist of a body, the special play of light on a face, and not spend your time doing the more drudgery aspects of uh, execution of paintings. So we have this here as, the, as what Botticelli grew out of. Now, he quickly grew far past this, but as a young man, might have painted things like this. Um, this is a picture um, which hangs right next to it in the exhibition, um, which is the Madonna of the Loggia, uh, so the Virgin Mary, of a kind of a complicated architectural setting. And compared to that of Lippi, we saw with that beautiful late one with that very heavy faux marble setting, which is simpler but way more successful. This one is trying kind of hard and not particularly succeeding. Uh, and I think I just, you know, you've got these columns here, and it's a loggia or it's a set of arcades, landscape behind, but, you know, the, the depth doesn't really work. And it's, uh, he's, he's ambitious, but... It's clear also the architectural setting, at least in this case, is not yet that important to him, or he's not figured out how to do it yet, because the emphasis is clearly on the figures. And I love the, uh, again, the tenderness, the faces overlapping. I mean, that's straight from his teacher, uh, Lippi, who does that often. Um, uh, there's a solidity to the bodies, and that's a key thing, both about Florentine art in general, but particularly in Botticelli. You really have these very strong contours, uh, these crisply uh, defined outlines, um, and that kind of sense of energy, though, and that's interesting, uh, that, uh, you know, the face is overlapping the arm here. That's just the pose in reverse of the one I showed you a minute ago, uh, the, the, tabernacle, the painting from a tabernacle that's currently housed in Palazzo Medici. Uh, that kind of arm, this is so much like Lippi. What's distinctive, though, is look at the legs, right? The left foot is pushing forward the bent knee here, and, the, and then the right leg is pushing off that. It's a stance that I have likened to that of a fencer, right? It's, it's energetic. It's more than that. It's dynamic, and it's something you don't see in Lippi, right? So where'd that come from? Well... Um, we can actually make one of that points. There's a contemporary artist of great talent, Antonio del Poliolo, and Poliolo means poulterer. His father was a poultry merchant, and um, Antonio was primarily, he had a brother too, and they worked together, but he was primarily a um, sculptor, but also made paintings and prints. So again, what we think of as a Renaissance man. But look at this. This is that same kind of dynamic pose we saw before, pushing off of the right, left bent forward. And what's important about this, um, I mean, clearly this, this uh, Saint, you know, Michael the Archangel um, uh, has God on his side because that's an awfully tiny shield for a very big dragon. <laughs> uh, but but what, I, what I particularly like about this, I mean, this is a, probably a banner for processions. It's very large. The painting is heavily damaged, but it's really kind of a revelation in this exhibition. It's hard to see in its normal home, the Museo Bardini. Bardini was a famous dealer, actually, in Florence. And many of our uh, 15th century sculptures, including, I think, the, the great Donatello uh, marble relief we have upstairs, came through Bardini. He was the main guy in the sort of 1870s and 80s in, in Florence. But anyway... 
to see it here in Boston is a great opportunity, and then to see it near early Botticelli, that is so exciting. Think of, again, this dynamic pose, not invented by Antonio da Pollaiolo. In fact, in turn, he had obtained this by looking, we believe, at ancient Greek and Roman art. Think of Greek vases, right, like a red figure vase, all those skinny, wiry runners, right, or warriors, you know, the skinny would always show in profile with, with uh, you know, elbows out, knees out, a lot of energy in that. Not placid, but rather really sort of buzzing uh, with power. And it's one thing. And then also think about a Roman sarcophagus, right? The Roman tombs often have battle scenes on the exterior uh, with, again, wiry athletic types with elbows, knees out. So uh, I would say, and, and Paleolo, in fact, also did a, uh, was also a major printmaker. This is important, one of the very first prints to be prominently signed right there in the upper left. Um, so the Battle of the Nudes, this is one of the great images of uh, Renaissance art. It's not so rare, there are more than a few in the world. We have a reasonably good impression here at the MFA, which is in the exhibition. Now, it's a very strange battle. I mean, it's clearly, uh, it's not, not clear who the various sides are. And the point is actually not to win a battle. The point uh, of this is uh, to, ha to demonstrate complete knowledge of the human body. If you're a sculptor and you're used to making bronze statuettes, one of the great things about that is you can just m rotate it in your hand. Or if it's a big statue, you can walk around it. See it from all sides. You can't do that with two-dimensional works of art unless, as Pauliolo uh, cleverly does, he has the same figure shown from two angles, right? We've got this guy here, and he's then mirrored that way, right? This guy with an ax from that side, this guy with an ax from that side. Guy on the ground, guy on the ground, leaning over, leaning over. So it's all these repeated figures to give you the impression of walking around. I mean, to us it looks like a kind of strange ballet, but um, in, uh, as a print, it's an absolute tour de force. Uh, and, and so, again, very strong contours, small amounts of shading uh, to reveal the three-dimensional or, or uh, depict three-dimensional form, essential in Florentine uh, design. So this kind of energy uh, also, uh, I mean, this print is later than early Botticelli, but I think that's an important point that um, Poliolo is adding energy. Uh, and so you take a lot of Lippi and a little Poliolo, plus Botticelli's own inner sense of gracefulness uh, and elegance, maybe, and that's how you get this young artist. Now, the third of our three, this again, this is a sequence of three paintings on one side. The Poliolo I just showed you is on the other side of the room. This is Filippino Lippi. Now, Filippino Lippi turns out to be the son of Filippo Lippi. Uh, Filippo was, so it's Philip and little Philip, and Philip was, uh, Filippo Lippi was a friar, a Carmelite friar. That's why he was looking at Masaccio and getting all sorts of great ideas about art. Um, but um, he did uh, transgress on his vows of chastity and uh, ended up uh, falling in love with a nun and having a baby with a nun. And the nun was um, the mother of Filipino. Now, it's a, they both got booted out of the order, but it's a happy ending because they got married and their son turned out to be a great painter. So, uh, <laughs> and, um, uh, and one thing about him is you can see what a good technician he is. This is, you know, painting's well over 500 years old, and the colors are just, just spectacular. I mean, he, he really knew what he was doing. And that's another important thing to think about. Going through the exhibition a few weeks ago, I was just reminded how these works of art were made to last, right? I mean, there's no sense of, oh dear, is, you know, is this a work of art employing a video screen or a light bulb that will not be made in a few years, right? Or something, uh, materials that are inherently fragile. But in fact, this art is, is, is made, was made to last, and more than five centuries later, we are the beneficiaries of this. Uh, beautiful painting, though, strong, strong color, uh, forms of color. Um, but a couple things I want to bring to your attention. Uh, because there's a comparison we shed up, set up in the exhibition. And by that, I'm talking about, um, uh, well, this was, we had an, this was early on the list of things we could borrow from the Uffizi, the most important paintings gallery, not just in Florence, but, but in Italy. And to borrow this painting um, enabled us to do something else. I'll get to that in a second. But just look at a few uh, elements of the composition. The Virgin Mary, although kneeling, is super tall. Her head is bent forward, not just because she's looking at her son, infant Christ, but because you've got a curved top here. So her back and shoulders kind of mirror, uh, echo the top of the 
painted surface, it's curved. Notice how the, the building behind her, this ruined barn, seems to kind of grow up out of her back, come straight up that way. Notice as well um, that her hands that, are, that she's praying are quite close to her neck, they're very high, they're not down low towards uh, the Christ child, the object of her veneration. And then as finally, another point is how the, she's got very voluminous, beautiful blue robes, uh, like we saw um, in the Madonna of the Book by Botticelli, but how this comes forward like a bit of a blanket and the Christ child rests upon that. Okay, so keep that all in mind because those are some of the same elements that uh, seem to have been done just around the same time or maybe a couple years earlier in a painting here uh, in Boston. And you can see very tall, kneeling Virgin Mary, extremely beautiful face there, it's just wonderful. Hands praying quite close to her neck, head tilted forward a bit. Now this is a, it's not a rectangle with an arch top. Instead, this is a completely round panel, what we call a tondo, right? It's on your list of, it means a round painting, a round sculpture. The building seems to climb right out of her back, going that way. And then the Christ child uh, appears to be on the extension, a bit like a blanket of the, um, uh, of the robes of the Virgin Mary. Now there's a difference here. We've got a really brawny uh, Saint Joseph uh, rather than the infant John the Baptist we saw in the other one. But one of the points we wanted to make in the exhibition, and that's the reason we could borrow this picture from the gardener, is that we have a you know once in a generation opportunity to put these pictures together, and maybe we could understand more which one comes first. So the gardener uh, museum was very happy uh, uh, to lend that. And in fact, this piece we wanted to really. Um, uh, emphasize our gratitude to the gardener. Um, and the, the wall, the rubric, the um, sort of overall theme for this whole section near this painting is blossoming. It's Botticelli in the 1480s when he's going, you know, just goes up and up and just doing the most beautiful, innovative art. Um, now, uh, great example of, of the Botticelli brand, and I'll be showing you some more of these wonderful pieces. Um, but I want to make clear um, that Sandro Botticelli didn't do this alone, right? He had a bottega, and he, there would have been a number of individuals at various stages of their life, uh, you know, their career, from very junior apprentices to ones who probably could have gone out on their own but preferred the steady paycheck of being the number two or number three in Botticelli's workshop, um, working under the master's supervision. Now, that's an interesting concept, steady paycheck, right? You know, it's a, it, it's, it's, it's money, you get, this Botticelli was a big enough brand that you got, uh, he got regular commissions of all subject matter, and that's a really delightful aspect of the exhibition that we have so many different kinds of paintings, right, on different formats. We've got furniture paintings, we have a fresco, we've got round, we've got vertical, we've got paintings from churches, paintings from private homes, um, things that are a very secular subject matter, right? You know, the beautiful, uh, glamorous, sexy Venus, and then things that are quite piously uh, you know, Christian at the same, you know, in the same space. So, but in order to do that, to work for someone else when you're a grown up, right, you have to subsume your own style into that of the master. You have to be able to swallow enough ego that uh, you're actually more, you've got to decide you're more content to work in someone else's style than to try to create your own. Interesting psychological challenge. Remember, Botticelli didn't stay in Lippi's workshop. He could have, presumably, he was that good. But instead, he wanted to go out on his own. Now, there is a surviving, very precious record of the mid Quattrocento, that is mid 1400s, training of artists uh, in Florence. And this is a number of albums and also some loose drawings that were not assembled in albums by an artist named Mazzo Finiguera. And Mazzo was primarily a goldsmith, but a good draftsman. And the, these are interesting because these are drawings about drawing. And we have here a Garzoni, that is a shop boy, a young apprentice in a bottega. And you know he's working, he's learning to draw, and so this is someone making a drawing, you know, Mazo making a drawing of one of his own apprentices, which is a way of acknowledging that the human body is central to really all aspects of art, particularly in the Renaissance, but also the active drawing is central to learning creativity. You know, you can't develop things uh, in your head until you have developed your hand uh, as well. Um, and the disegno, remember the word I uh, spelled for you a minute ago, D-I-S-E-G-N-O, it is the basis of Florentine art. And disegno is a double meaning, uh, I mean, in, Ita in the Italian language. A disegno is a drawing, that is an actual drawing on a piece of paper, the, the physical thing. But disegno is also the concept, okay, it's a kind of philosophical idea. Disegno is the concept of rendering the three-dimensional world on a two-dimensional surface. That is, you know, making a, a human being, a figure, an animal, a building, 
on a flat surface, like a page or a wooden panel, using only lines and shading. It's an art of strong contours, but it's also a confident art, right? You can't fudge these things. With design, you gotta draw exactly where, um, where the forms um, are going. And here's another drawing, uh, maybe a few years later. This is in the Uffizi, uh, and you can see this one. Uh, with, uh, it's quite precise. You can even look at the sort of shoes the guy is wearing, this, this Garzoni, this pupil, uh, the hat he has. Puff, you know, big thick coat might be winter, right? Uh, to be wearing that many clothes, and it even has uh, an old caption: un buon disegnatore, vuoi diventare un buon architettore," which you could translate as "I want to be a good draftsman and I want to become a good architect." This seems to be a, a period uh, motto or uh, declaration, right? This is this is how a young artist, uh, you know, by the act of drawing and drawing diligently could first learn how to draw, but then you can apply it to anything in the visual arts. And this is a key concept with disegno, that if you can draw well, well, you could go into goldsmithing, or you could go into painting, or sculpting, or architecture, or textile design, or all sorts of things. And so this is a wonderful uh, drawing as a, as a document, because it gets us sort of in, into, the, into the workshop uh, you know, at, at the time when Botticelli uh, was a young man. Now, um, so, the, 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 as I said earlier, the garzone, would, you know, there's various terms of apprenticeship where sometimes uh, you get training, and, and, uh, but sometimes the family would pay. It depends how much work they would do. It was usually set for a term. That's a complicated topic, but the key thing is you would start with the most menial tasks, right? Like sweeping up and doing errands and preparing colors, you know, that is grinding minerals and making paints. But you'd get more and more elevated, and particularly through lots and lots of drawing sessions, you would get a firm... Uh, a firm grasp of d rendering three-dimensional space, and then you'd start copying the master's own works. Um, beginning in the later Quattrocento, artists are now looking very intently at ancient Roman sculptures, right? And they're trying to draw them, deciding that the Romans had already figured out the principles of you know, beautiful proportions and elegant forms, and they were a greater civilization. And so the great project of the Renaissance was to integrate these ancient Roman and Greek forms with Christian subject matter. And that's, of course, how, much we, how we can explain so much of 15th century uh, Italian art. Um, and um, that... Uh, in the 1390s, Cinino Cinini, who uh, writes a kind of handbook of, for painters, and he makes clear, he says that disegno is the basis of painting, right? You know, you can't be good with a brush until you're first good with a pen or a stylus. That's absolutely key. Um, and Botticelli's own workshop was the prototype, or workshops like Botticelli, was the prototype for something like this uh, a couple uh, generations later. This is Florence. Baccio Bandinelli was a big sculptor in Florence in the mid Cinquecento, mid 1500s. Um, and he's a big rival of Michelangelo. And, uh, and you see, this is an evening drawing session, right? Uh, you've got fires burning here. Uh, there's, there's anatomy, there's like a, various skulls, sculptures. Uh, there's a skeleton there. These things being drawn with, by an oil lamp. They're looking at the same motif from several different angles. Uh, artists are probably talking to each other, critiquing each other. There are sculptures up here, things that could be drawn. And indeed, part of a bottega, I should emphasize, is not just the people in it, not just the various assistants that could be marshaled to do a commission, but also part of the bottega is its contents. You'd have portfolios and stacks of drawings, right? You'd have all sorts of sculptures. You'd also have the actual materials for making paintings. You'd have lots of brushes and, and various things for mixing and, uh, and, and sort of palettes and things like that. But the contents of a studio was very important, so much so it was passed down to the next generation. And artists who didn't have heirs would try to assure that one garzone would be brought up well, really trained, and then who could carry on uh, the family workshop. Um, and uh, what is what the thing's key about, presumably is these are books or portfolios of drawings on the upper shelf, but the idea is that, you know, a, 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 an idea of these, um, a drawing is, is a precious thing if it shows a pose or some sort of detail. And here you are, you're trying to do a painting and you want a standing figure leading to the left, but the drapery's got to fall in a nice way. Well, you could flip through your drawings you'd made five, 10 years earlier, maybe 20 years earlier or something, and find just the perfect solution, right? And, you know, the important thing, you'd vary it a bit, but if you'd already figured it out, 
years before, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. You could reuse that. And you know, it's hard for us to imagine in an era with infinite images on computers and books and television, but back then, having a store of images was a great resource, and that's another important thing about the contents of the Bottega. Now, um, so this whole range of activities, and it's all happening here at night with dramatic lighting. Is a, this is a imagine? It's now kind of Mazo Finiguera's single garzone. He's now all grown up into a much bigger quasi-industrial enterprise. Um, now, important thing: uh, this uh, talk about drawings again. And this, we have no drawings by Botticelli in the exhibition, but we do have some uh, prints designed by him. Um, and right from this, notice this beautiful figure uh, here at the right, how, how graceful her pose is and how just similar the, the feet are to the great painting. Again, this picture on the left, large canvas, is in the exhibition. Absolutely outstanding work. Arm is very similar, just the difference of her right arm uh, in pose. But you can see, you could almost call that a pentimento. If this were a painting, you see the face was once looking up, then looking over. And, this is, um, and there's a real question, though. It's uh, what is the relationship? relationship between these two. A drawing allows great versatility of function. You can make multiple works out of the same drawing. You could be, you could even make a new drawing and then make other works, or as I said a moment ago, you could go back and find the drawing that seemed to have the solution to the particular problem in your head right now. Um, and uh, this drawing is so similar to the painting. Was it just before, or maybe it was made just after? The idea is this would be a stage here in designing spin-offs and reworkings of the Minerva and the Centaur. That was a Medici family commission, clearly successful, beautiful and stunning, stunning to us uh, centuries later. But this might have been a step in that. Notice how it's been squared. You see, there's a, there's a very faint grid uh, in, in chalk over that. That's one way you can enlarge something to a big scale by then uh, making, the, making a larger grid, but the same proportions, and making each enlarging going from square to square. And that's a way of keeping uh, the proportions uh, consistent. Doing It's kind of time consuming, but this is something that uh, uh, you might designate, uh, delegate to your garzone, right? Your, your pupil, well, uh, he would have to do that. Uh, and indeed, uh, if, if you were going to make a, a, a cartoon that is the same scale preparatory drawing, that's exactly the thing you might assign somebody. Botticelli himself would make the beautiful drawing and said, okay, now s scale this up, use a grid, make it big, make the whole thing, you know, the drawing's this big, now you're going to make it six feet tall. And then I'll come in and sort of uh, adjust the contours at the end. Meanwhile, Botticelli himself could go on to some other project, right? So, so this, this is important thing, is that these elegant women are part of Botticelli's brand, and the contrapposto, right, this weight on, largely on one leg, the other leg trailing with a bent knee there, the graceful pose, um, uh, that becomes instantly recognizable. It's a sign of Botticelli. The, uh, his use of color, this overall composition, color on the surface, and so on. And Botticelli's uh, compositions were so well admired that an officer of the invading French army in 1494 requested a Botticelli of his own. Um, and, but that would be in the, the French native art of, uh, of tapestry, right? They don't have frescoes in France. They want tapestries. You know, so you can't easily move a fresco, though we have one in the exhibition here. But you could certainly easily roll up uh, a tapestry. And so that's very much the same figure there, figure of, of Minerva, um, quite similar to the drawing. And indeed, it may have well have gone from the painting to the drawing to the tapestry, not directly from painting to tapestry. And um, then uh, this drawing here is for the painting we saw on the first slides at the beginning of, of today's uh, class. Um, and this painting, uh, the whole is an upper upper right, very precious and fragile, never travels, so it did not come to Boston, though we have another adoration of the Mechai. And you see a beautiful um, preparatory drawing right here of these standing figures. You know, this confident but relaxed pose, clearly important to get right. This knee out, uh, beautiful way the light catches on, right on the side there. All those things, you don't want to be, according to Florentine art, figuring this out when the brush is in your hand. You want to do this ahead of time by doing careful drawings that determine the complicated things like the fall of light or the particular play of folds of cloth or where exactly something is uh, resting, those things you do in advance. Um, and, uh, and then you see here again um, uh, very, very similar 
uh, to this altarpiece. The hands are just the same, right? But the, between, the, this is John the Baptist here, by the time it gets to the painting, makes the figure younger, gaunter, uh, a little bit different. But this is a beautiful motif of this arm resting here against his thigh, and the, 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 the sense of then this arm is bearer. He's figured that out, and we'll keep that in the painting. So one of the points, though, um, uh, and, and you know, in, in both of these, we have uh, a drawing by Botticelli and a painting by Botticelli. In other cases, you could delegate. You'd hand the drawing to an assistant and say, you, you go work on that, I'm doing something else. Um, but uh, uh, again, the point about drawing, it multiplies the brand. It multiplies the efficiency of the artist. Um, and then here we have an example of a drawing for portraits. And this is you know, thought to be Simonetta Vespucci, who was the the prettiest girl uh, by far in Florence, and Botticelli would have seen her, uh, known her uh, pr uh, when he was young. Um, and you can see how this painting, is this a portrait or not? It, we're calling it an idealized portrait. You can see there, her chin is made a little softer, the bite's a little different, um, uh, you know, the nose is a little more prominent, perhaps to balance out her big forehead. The point being, it's been touched up a little bit, but look at this. This is in its own a magnificent drawing um, and a magnificent work of art. Uh, and you'll see that uh, there's the light source coming here from the extreme white, extreme right, all the white here, this beautiful highlighting here um, applied with a brush. Uh, would have, mean, would have suggested that Botticelli asked uh, the sitter to go face a window, so you'd have a very dramatic light that would then not only catch the features of the face, but also uh, the beautiful ringlets of hair uh, coming down. And this makes another point, is that uh, there's only so much time you could demand of a busy client for a portrait, right? Wouldn't it be more efficient to make a drawing from life something you can do more quickly. You don't need to mix any wet materials particularly um, or have a lot of, uh, have a big panel or a uh, big canvas with you. Do that drawing and then back in the comfort of your own studio you could do the time consuming uh, creation of an oil painting or in this case a tempera painting. So it's a way of breaking the overall artistic process into a series of discrete tasks. Now, one other thing I wanted to think about, though, um, just while we're on this, is, is a good as an analogy, right? Okay, because again, we're talking about Botticelli as an artist and as a brand, but a lot of his work or a lot of things credited to him, including some paintings in the exhibition, might have had very little involvement of Botticelli himself. He might have been there when it was done. He might have critiqued it and told his apprentice, no, make it a little, you know, move that shoulder down a bit, or, you know, why don't you redo that hand? Could have been that. Could have touched it up in various areas, or even in certain stances did most of the thing and uh, accept the kind of menial tasks of mixing the colors or cleaning the brushes. But an analogy I like to use is that of a fancy restaurant, right? And the point being is that if you go to an Alan Ducasse or Todd English restaurant, it's not like the person's in the back cooking your meal, right? The point is that that uh, restaurateur has devised uh, a series of recipes, series of preparations, trained a staff, probably come up with a name, maybe even designed the, the whole restaurant that is both the back of house section where the kitchen is and the actual dining room, done that, planned the menu, the specials, the seasonal variations, done all of that, but then allowed, delegated most of the steps uh, to other people. And when you have a meal in one of these very expensive restaurants that have a, you know, a, a celebrity chef, it's not like the person's making your meal, but rather everyone in it has been trained to work up to the level of the master. They're all subsuming their own creativity in the service of this brand. And I think that's a good way of thinking about it. Because you could, have a, you could, uh, you could uh, you know, take delivery of a, of a quote Botticelli painting in the 1480s with maybe not a lot of Botticelli in it, but you would still be happy overall because uh, it looked polished and had the strong contours and instantly recognizable um, appearance of a Botticelli. Now, that doesn't mean that they're not differences of quality. There are. And there is no single test by which we can say, you know, this is definitely Botticelli, this is somebody else, or this is a workshop assistant. You look for pentimenti, these visible corrections, that's one thing. Um, close relationship to a preparatory drawing is one. A lot is based, though, on the overall execution. If it's really beautifully done, the handling, if the fall of light, if the textiles, if the textures are really effective, 
just and with Botticelli, you're looking for beauty. If it's really beautiful, maybe that's it's mostly Botticelli. Um, and there are things that are much weaker that we would say, okay, Botticelli in workshop or lower down workshop of Botticelli or school of, style of, imitator of, we're getting later and later and further and further geographically from the physical Bottega. You know, people that might not have ever studied with Botticelli just looked at his art. But these are judgment calls. So in some ways it's a bit like legal uh, questions where you have to persuade a jury uh, or a judge rather than there's, any, there's not a sort of scientific basis. Um, but, but the point with um, by, particularly by the later 15th century, patrons are looking for specific styles and their documents, where, we'll get to one in a moment, where very discerning figures, you know, major uh, patrons, you know, big nobles, very rich figures, uh, kings, etc., want, want to know who's the best artist in a certain city, right? And so that's very much an idea of brand as we consider it in a, in a modern sense. So, again, a key point about the, the, the assistants, that is the helpers in the pupils, they help multiply the master's productivity. And then and a final example of how drawings are used is this rare book. Um, it's the Divine Comedy, uh, uh, which is you know, Dante's great uh, uh, poem, uh, a wonderful mix of religion and, and, and pagan learning. Um, but this is important. This is the first big Dante published in Florence in 1491 uh, with a commentary by Cristoforo Landino, who was a famous humanist and uh, uh, supported, he was a sort of protege of the Medici uh, family. And this, was a, this book was about making Florence look great. They took this great poem of 180 years earlier, um, and then they have in the big print right here, they'd have a passage from the actual poem, um, and then they'd have in the smaller print, this is all commentary, and then the illustration uh, was an engraving after a drawing by Sandra Botticelli. So it's a very deluxe book. Uh, we have Mrs. Gardner's copy uh, in the exhibition, and it's just a gorgeous thing. But the, we have a different page in the show, and one of them, the page we have turned to, the illustration shows Dante and his guide, Virgil, the Roman, uh, ancient Roman uh, writer, uh, pointing, looking up in the sky and seeing Beatrice, Beatrice, who was um, Dante's lost beloved, who's a beautiful willowy woman with long hair who looks just like a Botticelli heroine. So um, you can see he's very consistent. He has a type. So for this book from the gardener and then this tondo, this beautiful painting, um, uh, we are very, very grateful that our neighbors could contribute so generously. And notice as well, uh, this very, as I said before, hefty, beefy, brawny figure of St. Joseph. He is very large. He's not kind of passive in the background as often is in Renaissance paintings. Instead, he's vigorous. He's got a kind of, you know, football player's build. And um, he looks, in fact, he looks almost out of proportion, like he's just kind of too big for this painting. Um, and keep this in mind, though, because there's something impressive about his virility as a very large uh, and, and powerful figure that we will all get to in just a minute. So, a key thing, in the 1480s particularly, which is really Botticelli's high point, uh, is, you know, is, this is you know, m marvelous decade where, he, as I said, he, he goes from strength to strength. Um, in these years, he is doing sacred and profane subjects, that is, very religious, very devout paintings, and then things from uh, secular learning, classical religions, and, and, uh, and history is what we call generally mythology. There's an easy flow back and forth. The same artist, Botticelli, the same patrons are paying for this kind of art and appreciating both kinds of art. And that's something that's very comfortable. Would not always be that way. And the last part of the exhibition is how this artist is, uh, how Botticelli is uh, very much swept uh, by huge forces beyond his control, changes in politics and, and religion. But speaking of this easy mix of uh, secular and religious subjects, the, one of the stars of the exhibition upstairs um, is, is this beautiful Venus. And this painting comes from the Gallery of Sabauda in Turin, which is not a particularly visited um, museum. Uh, and if this painting were in Florence, for example, it would be much, much better known. Uh, in the literature, this picture is called Workshop of Botticelli. And to some degree, that makes sense, right? You're Botticelli. You finished making, painting the birth of Venus, because of course, the same figure, the central figure of that painting is the, is the main figure, the sole figure of this. And you could imagine saying, okay, I've just finished this masterpiece, you know, for the Medici family. You know, you Garzoni here, you pupils, you, well, let's make some, you know, replicas and we'll sell them, because I bet they're going to be popular. The thing though is th this is so, but this painting is actually you know, quite a bit different uh, than that. 
all the same, it is so close, right? I mean, you know, I, you know, I'll talk in a minute, the hair, et cetera, the amazing kind of transparent coat, uh, cloak or robe she's wearing, the very modern black background, the stone parapet, the strong lighting from the front right that really gives you the, uh, the impression of a statue. I find all of those indicative not of just some garzone, some assistant going and doing and making, you know, kind of on his own speed making uh, new paintings, but rather I see this as, uh, as Botticelli himself. That said, even the museum that owns it has had some misgivings about its attribution and tried to downplay it. If you look in the exhibition now, you'll see on the label it says Sandra Botticelli, and then in a different hand, written with a little brush, says Bottega in parentheses, saying that's a workshop painting. So sometime, and that looks pretty old, I'm guessing late 19th, early 20th century, someone said, you know, you know, if we're going to be kind of uh, you know, modern about this and decide that not everything was Botticelli himself, well then, you know, maybe this is by the workshop and not by, by an anonymous workshop assistant, not by Botticelli himself. And as we see here, uh, you know, of course, it is not nearly as big and splendid as the, and nor has as many elements, right, of the, of the sky and the sea and the beautiful landscape and then the winds at the left and the attendant on the right and the gorgeous drapery, you know, and the, the way that it fl everything flutters in the breeze and she just stands so gracefully with the most beautiful light on her thigh. I mean, it's, it's a great production, but this here um, is interesting because it's simpler, right, single figure, and it's actually one of two. Um, this is our figure here, um, uh, though ours is the only one, the one that comes from Turin, only one that has this beautiful transparent uh, robe. She's wearing a, there's a horizontal neckline, you can probably see right there, and then sheer transparent uh, covering her lower arms, so it's a kind of very fancy diaphanous nightgown, and then it, but it comes here and flutters in the breeze. It's just extraordinary. Um, this figure here in Berlin, um, this, this one might be a little later. The face is, I think, particularly pretty in ours. Um, different hairstyle. This is looser hair. Ours has pretty complicated braids. Uh, the one in Berlin uh, has brown hair. And of course, they um, uh, relate very closely to this. Um, and you can decide, though, are our paintings uh, just derivative or are they reworking? Is there spin offs? And I think, it, I think that's, that's latter. Uh, I think these are actually um, more than straightforward copies because the quality in this, I mean, first, the, the, the quality is so high, right? I mean, just the amazing effect of the light against her thigh, her beautiful face, hands. I mean, it's extraordinary. The, the braids are great. The, the um, little pearl in the part of her hair, it's very beautiful. And, and above all, that uh, negligee, that costume is just spectacular. So, um, you know, I think those are beautifully executed and also kind of complicated as ideas. This is not a straightforward, neither one of these is a straightforward uh, copy. And if this is not Botticelli himself, then it's his number one best studio assistant in the single two best weeks of the whole guy's career, right? <laughs> and so, you know, and, 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 and if, I'd like to know who that figure is, right? Who is that person, right? And, and so, what I, but I, the, the point though is in Turin, you cannot compare this uh, to another great Botticelli. But you can in this exhibition, because we have the Minerva and the Centaur um, from, the, uh, from the Uffizi. And I think putting them together, I feel that we did the right thing by calling this Botticelli on the label, the picture on the left, um, and then lower in the text of the label saying, some scholars believe this was produced by assistants in the workshop. That's enough of a disclaimer. But I feel quite confident that this is an absolute masterpiece and we are super lucky to have it in Boston. So, um, you know, it is impossible to avoid the birth of Venus when you're in Florence, right? Uh, you can get on a mouse pad or an apron or a calendar. Um, <laughs> and it's also, you know, an image that seems pervasive in modern culture. It's quoted, and lots of fashion designers use that sort of figure and memorably uh, was used in uh, James Bond's Dr. No of <laughs> Ursula Andress rising from the sea. Um, but I've, I've got, as, as impressive as Ursula Andress is, I think ours is much prettier. Um, <laughs> but I want to emphasize now for a minute, not just ba Botticelli's extraordinary popularity uh, in our time, but three instances of Botticelli's great esteem during his lifetime. Let's, to get back, we've thought a lot about context of how the art is made, but let's think about how it was received by his most astute peers. Um, one um, is a wonderful fresco from the Church of Onisanti, All Saints. It's a detached fresco. It was pried off the wall in 1564. Um, and this is present in the exhibition. 
because it was taken off the wall then when the church was remodeled. There was a choir screen that was taken down. And these were put then on the side, this was put on the side walls. It's a portable work of art. Um, in fact, the, the coat of arms, the little wasps, Vespe for wasps, and for this Vespucci family, so the same probably the same, um, uh, you know, the, the woman we saw earlier, Simonetta Vespucci, her family would have been the commissioner of this. Um, but this is St. Augustine in his study, and this was done, uh, as we're told, by Vasari, who was the great composer, compiler of biographies, um, uh, that this painting by Botticelli was done in competition by this one by Domenico Ghirlandaia, one of his chief rivals, same year. This is St. Jerome in his study. The point is, actually, that Augustine is writing a letter to Jerome, and uh, in, as the story goes, and Jerome, uh, while Augustine's in mid-letter, Jerome dies and Augustine realizes it. And you see the consternation on his face. He puts his pen in the, in the ink pot. He touches his hand to his chest in a sign of kind of, 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 of sincerity, realizing that his message will never be read. Uh, and it's, 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 it's a very moving painting. Um, but Vasari implied that there was um, uh, that, that there was a competition, uh, and there was seen as really, really rival works, and that from the detail in this face, and it's extraordinary, in the exhibition, go spend some time in front of this fresco, just how precisely rendered the bearded faces, the eyes, the hand, I mean, it's in a kind of hyper-focus, like we've all just gotten a new pair of eyeglasses, new prescription, it's really crisp. But implying that this greater detail of the face uh, meant a greater psychological complexity, right? Botticelli's figures are not just beautiful, they are also, uh, also of, of, of deep, deep thoughts. Um, so that's the first one in 1480. And from the quality of this, you can see why uh, Botticelli was called to Rome just about a year later, in the summer autumn of 1481. He goes to, the, to paint in the Vatican along with Perugino, Lorenzo di Credi, Ghirlandaio, who was the one of the Saint Jerome just a second ago, and Cosimo Roselli. And these were the best artists of Lorenzo the Magnificent, right? And um, this is, so Sandro has assigned three of the side walls uh, in the, uh, the, the newly built Sistine Chapel. This is Pope Sixtus. Um, and these are the st stories of, of the life of Moses. And you will, of course, uh, notice first these you know, big, virile male figures, but also the power and gracefulness of these women here near the well. Just beautiful, these uh, Botticelli types. Great landscape, too, though. Truth be told, his emphasis is always on uh, the human figure. Um, so that you're called to Rome, that alone says you're one of the great artists, and you get to do three frescoes rather than one or two. Well, the most revealing di uh, document, though, um, uh, comes about a decade later. And this is uh, an unidentified Milanese agent, so an agent from the, for the Duke of Milan. Um, he's the agent of Ludovico Il Moro, probably the most powerful man in Italy who wants to know about who are the best painters in Florence. And so he writes uh, this survey or kind of report of who the great painters are. And I'll translate in a second, but you can see Anu Aria Verile for Botticelli, that's the first one. Opera Ragione, Integra Proporzione. Then Filippino, Di Frati Filippo, that's Filippino Lippi, son of Filippo Lippi. Aria Più Dolce, sweeter mood or sweeter atmosphere. And then Perugino or Perugino, um, uh, another famous painter, then Domenico de Ghirlandino, Buon Maestro in Tavola on panel, or even better, in Muro on frescoes. So, looking at them now. So we have here Sandra Botticelli, excellent painter. So this is, again, priceless, you know, really precious testimony. Uh, these are people of great acuity talking about the top artists of the time. Now it's also a decade has passed uh, since he was painting in the Vatican, but Botticelli is still listed as number one. Um, his works have a virile atmosphere and are made with great thought and whole proportion, okay? And you see that in this picture, which is in the exhibition. And we've got this beautiful centaur right here, but looking absolutely miserable because Minerva, the goddess of wisdom, has totally dominated him. And she moves so gracefully. I mean, she's not just beautiful, she's incredibly powerful with a shield on her back and a huge pike there in her left hand, in her right hand, she grabs so elegantly the hair of the centaur there. So that makes total sense that this agent of the Duke of Milan uh, in the 14, early 1490s would note the virile atmosphere, virile atmosphere in Botticelli, and things are made with great thought and whole proportion. I mean, that's a very good statement. And then compare that to Filippino, who's the son of Filippo Lippi, who's the star of the beginning part of our exhibition. Um, son of the finest master of his time, his works have a sweeter atmosphere. 
Um, uh, and, and you can see the sweetness here. This is a beautiful painting in the Badia in Florence. But look at these faces. So sweet. But overall judgment, Duke of Milan, I don't think these have great quality, right? <laughs> then Perugino, a unique master, an excellent, excellent frescoist. His works have an angelic and very sweet atmosphere. And this is true. I mean, Perugino is really the sweetest of them all. Just look at these figures right there. Beautiful painting uh, in this case. Remember, these are not the paintings specifically that uh, the Duke is talking about, but he's trying to sum up the artist's art in a few well-chosen phrases or adjectives. And this one, to our mind, seems a great example. Um, and then finally, Ghirlandaio, who operates a big bottega in, in which uh, Michelangelo was at one point a pupil. Um, then the final point is Domenico Ghirlandaio, good panel painter, even better on walls, that is painting in frescoes. His works have a good atmosphere. He's expeditious, so he gets a lot done and as many commissions, right? So that, I think that's a really wonderful testimony with Botticelli, though, at top. So in thinking about how the exhibition was, um, was put together, I'll give you a few minutes on that to conclude, um, we had the option to borrow this, this death mask of Lorenzo the Magnificent. He dies in 1492, and that's the end of this golden age uh, where you have lots of commissions coming to Botticelli in this easy mix of classical pagan material and Christian religion, um, and then filling that void as the Medici family are expelled, the, French army of Charles VIII invades uh, Italy. We have Savonarola. This is, a, again, was going to be in the exhibition. We're get, getting very excited to have this other kind of material besides great paintings. Savonarola was a Dominican friar who was invited by Lorenzo to come back to Florence and sort of restock the convent of San Marco, the one that's famous for the Fra Angelico frescoes, where he had been an earlier generation uh, friar there. And Lorenzo wanted a great preacher, and boy, did he get one. This, uh, Savonarola had magnetic eyes, a booming voice, was the most charismatic preacher. Uh, he, he could preach to hundreds or even thousands of people at one time with his, uh, you know, in a very convincing manner. He was preaching doom and gloom, the end of the world if the Florentines didn't get their act together. The city was being punished because the Florentines were too wicked and they needed to reform quickly, giving an, uh, both the sense of his strong features, his sense of self-confidence, but also this harsh message. Look at that. That's the sword of God coming down on Florence, right? So, so the this, this subject matter of his sermons uh, was tough. He seemed to affect everybody and certainly Botticelli was somewhat affected. You could not escape it and members of Botticelli's circle and family were among the really deep adherents. Um, this was a possibility to borrow this locally, okay? This painting uh, is probably too damaged to be displayed normally at the MFA, but it makes sense at a university museum. It's owned by Harvard. It's a mystic uh, crucifixion. In this picture we have, you normally have Virgin Mary here and John the Evangelist here. Neither one is present. Instead, we have uh, Mary Magdalene desperately throwing herself on the ground uh, at the base of the cross. And here is a, she's looking up at an angel, very tall and elegant, striding forward with a weapon in his right hand and the left hand holding a animal by the foot. We think that's a lion, the marzocco, which is the symbolic of lion, of symbolic lion of Florence. So the punishment of Florence. We have torches falling from the sky, right? There, these are torches falling from the sky as these black clouds are pushed away. And then God the Father in the upper left is presiding on a throne as this golden light comes down and bathes the now cleansed or purified city of Florence. This is apocalyptic. It's end of the world. It must relate to some specific sermon uh, because it's set or it's a very complicated idea. But we're dating it around 1500 because it's it was you know 1500 like the year 1000, the year 2000, the big round number. People thought the world was going to come to an end soon. A painting not in the exhibition, but we allow. It's got the same figures of proportion, uh, same proportion of the figures. We call this just like that's the mystic crucifixion. This one's called the mystic nativity. Only painted painting dated by Botticelli, the year 1500. You know, you've got all these strange angels going around dancing. It's a it's a kind of similar in mood. Again, apocalyptic or end of the world. Um, our, our exhibition also had the possibility of a relatively new rediscovery. This was discovered in 2005 in Prato, just northwest of Florence. Major painting, but interesting, it's on a, it's about a third or half life size, but it's on a uh, shaped wooden panel, right? So it's a kind of, uh, uh, it's a uh, modified contour, like the contour of his body. And this was, uh, it's fascinating that something by such a famous artist could be discovered as recently um, as 2005. 
Um, and then we'd also have an adoration of the Magi. These are just some of the highlights, um, where it's hard to tell which actually are the three kings. It's an unfinished painting, lots of good disegno in the background, this underdrawing, the last thing on your list of terms, where you sketch out areas before you put on the paint layer, just to figure out exactly where they would go. Sketching on the panel or the canvas would come after a certain amount of drawing on paper, when you're really certain of things. Uh, so it's not clear which are the three kings. There are a number of candidates. They don't have crowns. They don't carry gifts. Um, but also interesting is this figure right here, who seems to be touching the edge of St. Joseph's robe with his hood and his nose and mouth and the features. Looks quite a lot like Savonarola. And I'm not really certain, um, you know, because Savonarola becomes the de facto ruler of Florence. He does these bonfires, the vanities, where presumably paintings by Botticelli went up in flames in these book burnings, you know, along with board games and musical instruments and mirrors and things like that. Uh, and, but by putting a figure who could be Savonarola, is he trying to sneak in after, uh, then Savonarola is actually, you know, is, is later killed, uh, and poor Botticelli has to witness these, you know, terrible uh, changes and convulsions in the society. But by putting Savonarola after his death in a painting, is that showing that he's sneaking him in, that he still is an adherent? Or by having Savonarola looking away, he's saying he's turning his back on the Holy Family. So I mean, some of these things are up for debate, but it's a very thick and, and, uh, and complicated uh, uh, historical question. Uh, we could also, within the exhibition, include our, um, some of our own works possibility. That was, and this is a big print. It's, um, you know, it's about three feet tall. Two plates of the Assumption of the Virgin, uh, very much in late, Botticelli's late style after the death of Lorenzo the Magnificent and the coming of Savonarola. When the secular subjects begin to drop out and you instead, his later work is religious and quite severe in mood. And then finally, paintings not known well at all. This is a late Botticelli. And part of our exhibition was to rehabilitate or even just consider the idea of late Botticelli. That is, you know, uh, uh, according to Giorgio Vasari, the great biographer, it said that Botticelli fell so much under the sway of Savonarola. He became too religious and his health declined and he didn't, he really wasn't, uh, he lost his way. And so one of the things which you look at paintings from this period and later, this could be even a bit later than this, but the point is his colors um, are getting cool, uh, the forms become simplified, everything gets flatter. Now we didn't do this alone. Um, you know, we had a whole bottega, you might say, here of people working at the MFA, but also we had a partner museum, the Muscarella Art Museum in the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia. And uh, they're a much smaller museum, but we partner with them uh, because they do a lot of the groundwork, legwork on exhibitions, and also for a cork of the calendar, they need to have a show open in early February because it's Charter Day, the celebration of the anniversary of the school. So they often open shows in late January. As you know, late January, or early February is low season in Boston, not a lot happening here, but by a show that opens in late January will close in early April, which means it can come to Boston in mid-April, which is the marathon and high season here, lots of tourists, all the graduations, lots of people coming through town. So it's been a natural uh, progression. This is actually the fourth show we've done jointly with the Muscarelli. Um, and when they presented us with a list of works that we thought they thought we could borrow together, our forces, we were quite excited. And then, as I said, we were going to expand that with a number of works uh, borrowed locally, which we're calling Boston's Botticelli's. On the label of these works, it says BB, right, which stands for Boston's Botticelli. So Harvard, Gardner, MFA. But BB is also the initials of Bernard Berenson, who was a century ago the great expert of this material. And one reason American museums, particularly around Boston, have a lot of things that are Botticelli and his contemporaries. Berenson thought in the late 1890s, early 1900s, that you know, really the most wonderful time ever to have been alive would have been under Lorenzo the Magnificent in Florence. And his examples of his best painter, Botticelli, are, are part of the message. So this is not MFA. This is William and Mary, the Muscarella. Uh, a bit like a college art museum. They've got a huge, um, a lot of text. They have a... <laughs> th I mean, they, you know, they're, they're, you know, they're professors. They explain everything. But they've got a title and a subtitle. And even their subtitle has a subtitle. So the... <laughs> We decided we would not do that here, but I did take great admiration of the beautiful red uh, color. And this is a central thing about museum work. If you see a beautiful color, no need to be original. Just take their color. Okay. Um, this is their insulation during the process of insulation, okay? And you can see there's the death mask of Lorenzo, and this is the metal showing Savonarola, so you really see the shift there. They've not put up their labels yet. This is that beautiful shaped crucifixion I mentioned uh, a minute ago. Uh, their beautiful red. And then here you see it 
packed with people. Uh, their techs are now up. It did extremely well uh, in Virginia, kind of an extraordinary thing uh, uh, to, to find in, in that you know, college town an exhibition with this many great loans from, from Italy. Um, and they also got what they'd never had before, which is a major article praising an exhibition in a national publication. And this was a, most of a page of the Wall Street Journal, Beauty on Heaven as it is in, Beauty on Earth as it is in Heaven. And it was just so extraordinary. The Muscarelli was thrilled uh, by that. But what we had a couple of advantages. One, the great Minerva and the Centaur could only come to Boston. That was the decision of the Fitzy, so we we're very lucky that way. And I, as, as I said, we began to add things from local uh, institutions, Gardner, Harvard, MFA to sort of fill it out. This is some interesting behind the scenes shots of the show being put together. This is the courier. This is a person who comes from the representative of the museum or collector uh, to make sure the thing travels and that the painting is not left you know, on the side of the road someplace. Or, um, uh, and it is carefully installed into place. The alarms are put on, all that sort of thing. And this is one of our paintings conservators. She's wearing uh, called an optivisor, which is a high magnification to look very precisely at the surface of the painting to make sure that nothing bad has happened to it during the transit. Uh, we've got things already on, 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 up on the walls. Um, uh, this shows the beautiful Lippi, the late painting by Filippo Lippi. Um, it traveled without a frame. It was packed beautifully, but we had to make a big, uh, put in a big kind of plexiglass box or bonnet to protect it, examining the surface uh, very carefully to make sure that uh, everything is fine. Interestingly, frames tend to get damaged a little bit, you know, but that's kind of the point. Just like your suitcase protects your clothes when you travel, the frame protects the edges uh, of a painting. Um, and then on the back wall, so these are, these are two couriers from Italy right here, again, the MFA conservator uh, examining things. Uh, this is a color printout, uh, kind of a poster, just to figure out where on the wall the painting is gonna go. Because of course, once it's up on the wall and the courier, that is the representative leaves, you can't move it, right? So you gotta know exactly what you want. And then on the back is that print, that, that engraving of the assumption, uh, which is an MFA work. And one thing we did is we put all the MFA works up first before any of the works from Italy arrived. Um, now, this is the Madonna, the book, putting that up on the wall, and it's one of those things where they, you know, I said left, right, higher, lower, and then, <laughs> um, you know, finally, finally came to a good conclusion. This is just the mock-up of the lettering, which is going to be done in, uh, in white uh, vinyl, which is very um, easy to read, big print, um, so very happy about that. Um, and there you see it uh, all installed and beautifully lit. And lighting, of course, just like with movie stars, lighting makes uh, a huge difference. Um, this is the center part blossoming with the great Minerva and the center there in the middle and the Venus. Um, so very happy uh, about how that turned out. It does not look so empty uh, these days. This is the last section where we tried uh, particularly to talk about late Botticelli and to think about Botticelli's work after the death of Lorenzo in 1492 and the coming of Savonarola and the bonfire of the Vanities and these convulsive changes uh, in Florence. Uh, I was able, or that's the cross from Prato. Our electrician was able to do a wonderful, uh, I said, could you put a dramatic spotlight so we have a nice you know, shadow on the back wall? And he, Definitely did that. Um, and then finally, I want to just end for a minute thinking about our own painting, right? Because long after the exhibition closes, we still have the works in our permanent collection. Um, and this is this Botticelli. When I was hired by the MFA in 2001, I came and quickly did a brief survey of the most important uh, Renaissance paintings. I was hired as the Italian paintings curator. And I think her face is very beautiful. I mean, she looks quite a bit like the actress Uma Thurman, I think. Um, and. <laughs> I liked her hands. I never really liked the way that John the Baptist seemed stuck in there, um, uh, kind of awkwardly. And the architecture is kind of strange, though there was an interesting pentimento, a visible correction. The flowers were originally bigger, taller. They were lilies, and then they were re uh, replaced by roses. That was interesting. You know, I wanted something like this. <laughs> this is what we want. You know, the Madonna of the Book, something very graceful and lyrical and detailed and softer, not hard and rigid, because the MFA painting is admittedly hard and rigid. Um, one thing you can do, though, to improve a painting is to put it in a more favorable frame. Now, this shows three, three different uh, frames around, the, around our painting. The one on the far left is the painting's frame up until the mid-'80s, and it really made it look like a Christmas card in the big red. <laughs> um, the one in the middle is a beautiful, and that's a reproduction frame and not a good one. The one in the middle is a beautiful old frame, but two problems. One, it, it's so deep, right, and it cuts off the bottom and the sides quite a bit, uh, and the top. It's just not the right size. It wasn't made for it or vice versa. Um, 
I wonder uh, if this frame actually was made for a relief sculpture. Imagine a marble that's several, a bar relief several inches deep, how well it would look in there. The other problem though is this a greenish blue around the alternating with the gold that f kind of fights with the bright blue of the Virgin Mary's robe. They just didn't go well together. Instead, we had this beautiful frame made in uh, London about six years ago. Sadly, the price of gold was very high then. Um, but this, this is a, a, a Florentine frame from around 1500. Um, and uh, even in this photograph, you can see how it makes the blue really sing. Gold does bring out the blue within a composition. And a, so a key thing about this, this picture as I began to get to know it and see what various experts had said, is they acknowledged that it was stiff and austere and rigid, but that's because not because it was done by a workshop assistant, but rather because it's a product of late Botticelli, when his own style, in response to personal piety and these great the changes around him, became, more, uh, became sort of more severe. Also in the course of the research was important seeing a painting that had often been related to it. And this is the Lankaronsky Tondo private collection, exact same composition as ours. And indeed though, notice how that John the Baptist in the um, upper um, left seems a little better. If the composition's round, it makes more sense than in the rectangle. So this was an exhibition and I was able to see it at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London last year. And when I saw it, I was overjoyed because that painting is so ugly. And our picture, by comparison, is much more beautiful. And, uh, you know, I mean, just, just think about this, though. I mean, imagine how my heart would have fallen if I had gotten there in the exhibition and seen this and theirs being really wonderful and ours, in comparison, kind of a dog. Um, but, but see, you can make an apples to apples comparison, you know, for face, hair, hands, figure John the Baptist. Every single thing is so much more subtle, so much more beautifully executed. So I would say that one is Workshop of Botticelli, and ours is mostly Sandro himself. But I do acknowledge that the composition works a little better as a round painting. And so there might have been a tondo by Botticelli that is now lost and derivative weaker works were made in the round format and a bigger, not, partic not completely successful one was made in a vertical format, uh, but more by Botticelli himself, that's ours. But the missing piece though is to not just to see these different arguments, but to put our painting in juxtaposition with a truly great late Botticelli. Um, that's this one that has come from the Gallery of Palatina, which is Palazzo Pitti in Florence. Uh, very beautiful painting, probably a few years later than ours, but again, harsh contours, very austere, very quiet in mood. Um, and this one has uh, an extraordinary motif of the Virgin Mary lowering her son, Christ, to the embrace of his cousin, John the Baptist. See how the Virgin Mary and Christ are beautifully in parallel, but by lowering his body, Christ child's body, she is foreshadowing or prefiguring the lowering of Christ's body from the cross to the ground after the crucifixion. So it's an incredibly deep and powerful idea and that you know, all their eyes are closed because they understand the uh, inevitability of his sacrifice. So to put these two together though is the sort of curator's uh, you know, opportunity of a lifetime. I'm so happy to see our picture. Um, in this context, notice how most of their eyes are closed. Notice how they work beautifully as kind of bookends. Same three figures, they have roses in each. Uh, the figures are so large they almost take up uh, you know, the whole width of the uh, uh, of, the, of the pictorial field. The, the Virgin Mary in this truly great painting uh, leans forward as if to fit into the picture. It's such a, you know, there's something very heavy and ponderous about this. Um, now, I would probably prefer if the Galleria Palatina would allow a switch, we could send this to Florence <laughs> and, 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 and keep this one uh, for us in Boston. But that be said, I think we've, we have uh, seen by seeing that how well ours, ours holds up, if not quite the masterpiece, it does hold up beautifully. See that? That's another wonderful feature of an exhibition. So um, on, this on this pair, I'd like to end by saying that this last portion of the exhibition, the far end of the show, we're able to some degree, I believe, to disprove what Giorgio Vasari wrote when he said that the late Botticelli lost his way, where he said that he fell too much under the sway of Savonarola, uh, he lost direction, and his health declined, and he really couldn't keep painting. I would say on the contrary, on the basis of works like this, of their great profundity and intensity, it's not that Botticelli lost his way, but rather that he was forging a new and personal, personal path. Thank you. Thank you, grazie.